Okay, I'm Melanie Karas Moniotis from Art and Up, uh, joined by my co host, Christine Ballard from Art and Up, who I'll be interviewing today. So I have a series of questions. Very excited, Christine, I am to hear what you have to say. And we're going to start off with Were you always a creative person? Yeah, actually. Annoyingly so, when I was uh, born and I was only teeny tiny, I was always making stuff. I had to clear the pencils off the table to have dinner. I was always being kind of yelled out about that. And I ended up being put on a tablecloth on the floor and I used to make little houses and little hats with little paper boxes mm. and that was day one. I didn't get to go to preschool, so I made my own preschool. But, um, yeah, that, that always started and then did art at school um and then went on to high school hsc oh i didn't have a lot of art around me my mom and my dad were crafty so my mom always made she was a homemaker but we had a lot of pottery and um patchworks and lots of sewing and things like that i was always stealing the good scissors my dad was a, a carpenter by trade and a wood turner uh, as he got older so there was always lots of tools and things. No one really sat down and did nothing in my house. So it was always creative but more crafty until I got into my high school years. But at what point did you decide, that's it, I want to be an artist? Well, I decided I want to be a graphic designer first. Um, I wanted to do art and the only way that I could see to do that was be a uh, at the time graphic designer. And I really wanted to be a graphic designer. I loved colour. I loved shapes and designing things and having ideas about things so instead of just doing craft things that's where it sort of translated for me at the time at school graphic design was a really big thing apple Macs had just come in no one really had computers and a bit before that even when i went and did a i then went on to do a design degree so i've got a bad i'm a bachelor of arts in design i'm a bad behind my name <laughs> Um, that sort of went into fine arts as well as graphic design and industrial design so that you could jump out at the end and go towards those fields. But you needed heaps of experience before you did that. But that's sort of where the art life went. And in that time, being a graphic designer did require you to draw and paint and do sculptures and make models and it was all beautiful and amazing and you had lots of coloured textures and pencils and things like that and then the computer came along. Mm. And we ended up sitting in front of a TV, too close. And so graphic design sort of changed. And that was sort of the sad thing. All of us loved colouring in, you know, pages and pages and marking up things for print. You know, you take you two days to mark up a newsletter for Commonwealth Bank with your squeakers, we called them, and um, that beautiful smell and tracing paper mm. and send it off to the printers. And it was all very arty and hands-on and then computers came along and sort of sucked the life out of that that mm -hmm. creative process because everyone could feel like they could do it themselves and everything had to be really quick then so from there um I decided that yeah I thought I was being an artist when I was being a designer and I would do a lot of a lot of my design work was um illustration and uh just pixar it they said oh, okay just pixar the shape so um i thought that was being an artist and i did do some really lovely work experience when i was at school to see if i wanted to do that because i didn't have anyone in my family who was a designer or was in that art field so i went off to ashton scholastics who i'm very fond of still they do all the kids educational books and went into the art department there and that was magic you know all these people did art and they got paid it was so exciting but being an artist, so then when I was a graphic designer and I came to Sydney and I worked for a design company, worked out that you just had to be very obedient and when you're a junior designer, you go back to the beginning and really listen to what people are asking you to do, take a brief properly. It really taught me about discipline and also about agenda. Like sometimes you might have the most brilliant idea, but if the client didn't want that, it doesn't matter how much they sell it. And if it takes you two days to do something and you only got quoted half an hour, then it kind of was a failure. Mm. So that's when I was really frustrated and I went and did some art things. Maybe I could be an, a, a kid's book illustrator. And so I went and did some courses. I was a bit of a course junkie. I love doing courses and I love learning. So I went to, you know, apart from the cooking classes and the dancing classes, I went to um, 
an illustration course in the uh, in the evenings after work and thought oh, maybe I could be a book designer and that's where I met my um 2B business partner where I started an art school so we started off from three students doing some life drawing and that went over a number of uh, about 12 years in uh, Mossman and had an art school with about 150 students so I did that as well as being a graphic designer and a studio manager uh, to see if that's where art would be and I love doing that I love teaching and yeah that was art but it wasn't being an artist because it took took up a lot of time so in between that I built it into being what I would call an artist but I never really called myself that then I was just painting and working it all out really it wasn't until I got fed up with design to a point where I decided to jump and make that, give it a couple of goes, uh, three goes. I gave it three goes. Um, first time was 2008 where the bottom fell out of the art world, so I quit my graphic design job because it's a 20-hour-a-day job pretty much and tried to find my soul back in my art and offer classes when we had the art school then, but the economy fell out. and so. I had to think of other ways to do that. So I invented art parties. I invented corporate art parties. I even went and did life drawing for hen's parties, you know, and I became a manager of that, in which, you know, it's a, I suppose those problems are good problems to have, right? Oh, woe is me. I have to go and teach drawing. Isn't that hard? You know, people would not feel very sorry for me. But it, it was challenging because you have to really sell those classes and there's a lot, you know, we know in the print industry that every um, thing that you send out in marketing, it's 5% hit rate and it's a 1% conversion. And people don't like it when you tell them that, but maybe I have to remind myself with that in art too. But that's pretty much everybody works hard. So that's where I went more into the art world and really immersed myself into trying to create a body of work. What was that? Uh, sharpen up my skills, went and did a lot of workshops. And I started going to residencies. Well, I started applying for residencies, which is um, you get to go overseas and you have to pitch like a job and immerse yourself in the location. I used to choose places where I could be, be also being an art teacher or facilitator, shall we say, uh, learn, be around great galleries, in which I was really fortunate to do some of those in amazing places, uh, the Art Students League of New York, which is a very, very famous uh, institution. Uh, George O'Keefe and Jackson Pollock taught there, and this was a step away from from the New York Manhattan base. It was over on the mainland, but now, um, and I got to do that twice, which was really, really lovely. And that's where I found this art community. Oh, that's where all the people are. That's where they're talking about, and that's how you learn about the industry. It's bad shows they might have had or experiences of, of uh, exhibitions or gallery shows or um, museum things, just how the world does it. And we're all pretty much worried about our work all the time. But mm -hmm. you got to see that for four weeks and that was really, really lovely. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I have learned that you have to take those opportunities when they come because some of those places are closed down. So I did that in Spain and I was fortunate enough to do some in Venice. I've done two in Venice, which I chase light. So I focus on colour and light. And so I want to learn about what happened before. I don't want to sort of, I might be inventing something that was invented, you know, 100 years ago. So that would be dumb. So go and do my homework and just immerse yourself around art. I think when sometimes when you, feel like you've lost your way going to a gallery and go, oh, yeah, that's why I do this. These guys really were on it. That was the type of thing. So that's where I started to, do, to be more of an artist as well as teaching art at the same time. So wh where do you actually create your art? Where do you practice at the moment? At the moment I have a little backyard cabin and you can probably hear the plane going over. I live near the flight path in um, my backyard. It's a two and a half by five metre room and I do most of my work in there. If I do a residency or travel away, I try and pick something that's got a really nice big space so I can stretch out a bit. So I do enjoy working on big things, but you can't do that. Like there's virtually nowhere to swing a cat here. 
which is good for the cat, but you know, <laughs> else. So, and all their trauma, you work so hard and then you, you don't want to put a hole through your work. So I do, I am very fortunate to have my own space. And that's something that I, I always suggest to each of my students is if there's just a tiny corner of the room that you can just leave your work out, just to have a look at it and see it. And it also reminds you that you're an artist, I think. Yeah. Um, we're very visual and that's why we can't be very tidy. We have to have our stuff out looking at everything <laughs> and reminding us. So, And sometimes just staring at that. You know, designers, they used to, uh, when I worked in the printers, they used to not understand us in the design studio because they're very productive people and, and ideas are hard to show as being productive often mm -hmm. and they would say we stare at trees out the window. You know, yeah. they really know that. As an artist, your brain's going all the time. You can't turn it off. So that's that's the main space. I've been really fortunate too in the past. I've had a one beautiful lady in Hero Billy, just loved having artists around, so I got to have her studio with magnificent views. I've been really appreciative of the opportunities that I've got and grateful for those moments. And I know now that you just have to take them. You never know where they'll lead you or they'll just give you some lovely memories at the end. So you know, I've had some amazing, you know, views out the window in, in Venice where I can hear Vivaldi and just ridiculous show-off moments, but they're only, they don't often come around and I think that you really do appreciate them. And maybe I appreciate that kind of part in the art life too because I have come from design and I have something to compare it to. It's really hard if you don't have that contrast, but... Yeah, that's where it is at the moment, and I have a storage space where I store all my paintings that I haven't sold. So um, and that kind of gives me a little bit of, of space and, and also notes. If you're a teacher, you have lots of notes and visuals, and being in the visual arts, we have a lot of books. I actually also have, um, which I might show you later, I've got in the spare room a whole wall of, of art books that I use for teaching and for learning. You know, I often say... If you don't know what to do in your work, then go and ask a mentor. And they're all in those books. You know, yeah. what would Go Gan do? Hang on, I'll just go and check. <laughs> uh, talk us through materials and mediums at the moment. So I do a number of things, but the process is sort of worked into a pattern. Is if I'm traveling and I'm going away, this materials are a real pain because you can't carry some. Uh, so I usually do pen and wash when I travel and um, that gives me ideas. I love, one of my favourite things is love sitting in one spot and just drawing what's in front of me. Way better than taking a photo because things happen in front of you. So I just pulled out a few. These are things that I've done in Spain. So these little drawings here are mm -hmm. uh, just pen and wash. They don't mean anything to anyone, but when I look at them, they might remind me of the, the colour of the sky or the height or something that I can translate into my work. And, of course, you never do them just all on the spot. You might spend half an hour in that one spot and then a truck parks in front of you. Beautiful. <laughs> but it's manageable. And uh, especially when I travel around in Fiji and stuff, I just really love being stuck, you know, in a rainforest in the rain. They're just magic moments and it really teaches me to slow down. Um, I'm not very good at that, which you can probably tell. But um, that's the process. So I start with that or I'll start with pencil drawings, um, which are sketches. Now, when I do sketches, um, I, I'm practicing on doing a style called pragmatism, which is deconstructed shape and reconstructed color. So I like to pull apart the shape and I like things to wrap around you. So I'm trying at the moment to get rid of more of horizon lines so that the ground and the, the background and everything sort of rolls into one, a bit like your dreams. You know, they all merge mm -hmm. in. One and break up those shapes. I can't get out of my graphic design mode. Everything has to be sharp. I'm trying to get fuzzier on that. Um, and so that's where that sort of helps me do that. I find it's really loose to do those drawings, even though they might be a bit more realistic. I just like observing things. And if you look at that, then you're not thinking about anything else in your head. And then from the sketches, I will go to, which I'll put some pictures in over the top, um, I usually sketch it up on a canvas loosely with charcoal. Uh, one of my devices is to get a little bit dirtier, less graphic, and so I'll use the charcoal and then I'll wash it in with acrylic. So I'll we'll always have a colour, a selective colour palette. And you can see one of the things that I do up here is when I go to countries and places like that, because I love colour history and how we see colour, I'll make up some palettes about what colours are there and usually... 
I have discovered that as an Australian painter, you paint with a format. So you paint your shadows a certain color or your, your go, those go-to colors. And it takes a while to immerse yourself in that landscape. I kind of feel like color affects everything around you. So it does have an effect on the tree that you might draw or the, the pod or, or something like that. And I specialize in still life usually in landscape. Mm -hmm. I've done figurative work because I do love life drawing. Um, and there's some on the go there. We all like to dip our toe in the water a little bit. But it's always colour. It's always driven by colour. So then from there I'll go and um, once I've got the acrylic and it's really, really messy and it's all drippy and I use a lot of water when I start off so that it will run and it breaks up the shapes out of my control, which is really good. And then I have to learn to listen to the painting and it tells me what to do. Over mm -hmm. time you get better at that. And then you break up those shapes and I have a limited colour palette. So you can probably see there's some on the wall here. This is a midway break where you can see there's it's all running together. Mm. Uh, and um, that's a warm colour palette. That's a series a series called um, Land of Oz, which mm. is related a little bit to Wizard of Oz and the colours of Australia. Um, and then once I've done that, I will just put layers and layers of colour over the top to get a glow. So what I'm going for is I want to be an impressionist with light and I want to be a phobus with colour. So the relationship of colour together, you know, I do, people call it a bit of an army camouflage mm. pattern. It's about how that affects our rods and cones and how those colours pulsate. So uh, if you look at a set of colours, they might be atmospherically cooling or calming or vibrant or things like that so that area where I might travel I want to try and capture that so I will call that sensations on how you move through a, a landscape on mm. in how those colors sort of vibrate against each other and that's why I have an interest in color history and so then I'll work it up and you can see the, the layers I used to do solid colors and now it's thin layers over the top a bit like an opal you know how it shines yes. And then I'll end up with little, you know, there's no, hopefully I'm trying to get rid of a bit of a horizon line there, but some sort of colour mm. set. And that will be evocative of the location of where I might be. I, I will always be an abstractionist, I think. I shouldn't mm. say that. At the moment I'm an abstractionist rather than an abstract artist. So an abstract artist starts from nothing and builds up on the canvas. Abstraction artists think about Picasso, um, was always inspired by something and then broke it up and did their own version. Mm. And I like that. I like storytelling. Yeah. So that's how I usually work through. And, and that last um, bit is with oil paint. And, again, that's why I go and look at the history of oil paints. There's certain oil paints, depending on when they were made at a certain time. So there's classic colours behave differently to impressionist colours, which behave differently to modern colours. And modern colours are our acrylics. They were only made in the 1940s. So I love all that stuff and maybe it's mm. about things, but that's the process that I usually work on and I work in a series. I'll always have a, a theme of whether it's around in a location or it's a colour set or something like that. Picasso taught me that to mm. work in series. I didn't get him. I went to Spain and then I worked out. I saw his Lemininas, um story or his version from um, Velasquez and he did 20 to 30 versions, like, oh, what about this in this section? And then regurgitated that to his version. And I, that taught me the reason to do a series because if you've got a good idea, one or two is just not enough. It's got to be strong enough to go through that. It's from design as well. If you, when you're doing logos and things like that, you never just do one or two. You would make, um, you know, even your cheek genius do like do 50 50 sketches yeah. and it all falls into each other it's not really wasted because you're kind of refining and i think that's how i build up my paintings too now talking about all this work christine you know thinking about your um investment in the his historical nature of art and and meshing that with um practice and materials and everything else i mean that's all too time consuming you think there's not enough hours in the day how do you schedule your time there never is yeah. one of the things i learned from graphic design was how to do a time sheet i used to have to do the time sheets when you're a designer or you employ designers you have to justify every 15 minutes of their life in your workplace and i really really hated that i thought when i 
um, left design that I wouldn't have to do a time sheet anymore. Mm. And you know what? That timing and calculating when you're going to do things has actually been the best thing for me because now I do, I can fit in things. So I do teaching and then I, I do study on the, the history of colour and I do art functions and then I do painting. So I have to factor that time. I mean, I'm a bit of a night owl, so I quite like working at night. Mm. I don't have children, so I don't have to run off and pick them up from school. Mm. But some reason I still have no time. Um, now, how do you stay motivated? Like what happens when you actually, because you're human, well, semi-human based on what you do, but when you do hit a flat spot, well, how do you dig yourself out of that? I've just been through a flat spot at the moment and I'm really good at telling students how to get out of a flat spot, but uh, doing it is harder. And I've kind of worked out that when you hit a flat spot, it feels like you've lost your way mm. and you might be not getting into a show or someone that you thought th that you really wanted to impress didn't like that work or it just stuff didn't happen and it was really up, made up in your head of what you wanted to have happen. No one told you it would happen in the art world. You've got to be very self-motivated with that. And so when you, you fall into a little flat spot or a hole and you're right, I'm not talking to art anymore, I'm going to go away. And that's probably the best thing you can do is just mm. not talk to it for a couple of days. Yeah. Um, or you feel a bit wounded and you're like, oh, I'm not talking to you, I'm going to break up with you. Right, maybe I'm good at something else, which is stupid. But um, I think definitely going away, like having a little bit of a break, don't force your art because you just do crap anyway if you do that. But how you can do that and how I do that for me is I really need to go to an art show or I need to go to the art gallery or I need to holiday where I can go and sketch something or just I still I can't not talk to it. I've found that out. But sometimes it could be just cleaning up your studio, you know, like, oh, I remember you. It's okay. I am an artist. It is okay. It's and so I found yeah, and even if it's just going for a walk and just saying, right, I'm only going to look at the colour of the leaves or something like that, but it is a mental game. It's like yeah, it, oh, this, the muscle. Imagine. I think you would understand too, Melanie. Like it's, it's easier said than done, that working the muscle, especially if you're really tired too, if you're running around and doing things. One of the things that I learned in my scheduling is, and I have to get back to this because I've lost my way a little bit, um, is to put art first. Mm -hmm. And and that's really hard because people will say, oh, it's just a luxury thing. It's like, well, no, this makes me run better. So yeah. I found that um, I would try and put my art in from 9 to 12, uh, you know, even if it was only three days. I, I would like to paint every day if I could. But you physically can't paint for four hours straight. Like mm -hmm. you just you end up messing it up. So whether that's why you have a few paintings on the go, I think. You know, then you do you get yeah, the blue do the blue across a lot of things and yeah. they take the design. And I and I think, yeah, that sort of that scheduling, you know, nine to twelve and then everything goes out. You know, I used to I listen to a lot of podcasts and and music sometimes, but a lot of podcasts and I love learning. So having those on in the background, um really helps me like this that we're making could be like uh, things like talking with painters and stuff yeah. really helps me get into the mode I feel like I'm being me and I'm just concentrating on that work and, and being an artist you're not always creating amazing things sometimes you're just coloring in and just you know preparing a canvas and it's all a bit boring with that stuff but it has to happen and so I feel like that that's that's how that helps me just get back there and yeah I think, I think that's it. But it always changes. Um, and taking notes, I'm always taking notes. I've got heaps of notepads everywhere and that's a challenge. If you like learning, you write down notes and then you put your paintbrush down. Mm. So having that strict 9 to 12, used to be get in and listen to conversation hour by 11, that's it. You know. Mm. But what happens is I found a lot of my students do this too is you get the day gets a hold of you. And then art's the luxury, right? So you put it at the end and then the end is like 10 or 11 o'clock at night mm. and you're tired and you're doing crappy work and it's horrible and you knew you weren't being an artist anyway. And it's like, oh, you know, the thing, it's like going for a walk or kind of exercise, I think, as an artist, is, you know, you, you need to feed the beast to a point. And so doing the art first will make you better for all those other things. Absolutely. But, Maybe the washing doesn't get done and the groceries get ordered online or something, you know. <laughs> Do you um, want to be remembered for that? No. 
Exactly. And how important is social media in your art career? Well, coming from a graphic design world where we would sell that up a lot, I do have a conflict of interest to a point where I, I, I you look at my social media and it looks like I'm doing a lot and I, it does take a long time. Mm. Um, having a story and, and so I will promote that to clients or, or other artists like, yeah, get that out there. But what I've started to realise is um, so I might post every couple of days or I usually plan it so when you busy person it's best to plan like a week's worth and then say what you're going to say and that's it and interact very little I think um the point is it's good to respond to other people but it can eat your day you can go down the rabbit hole and it's really good to be supportive but again time sheets restrict yourself to 15 minutes while you're having that coffee make it become a habit that's connected to something you know, that between this time and that time, do that with the social media. I'm really good at saying that. I'm not very good at sticking to it, but I've got a plan. Um, so, but one of the things that I have realized is even if you don't have a website, your social media, just say Instagram because we're visual, um, Facebook's more community, I would say. So going to shows and things like that, that's really great. But to show what you're doing, you don't have to show what you're doing all the time. I think show your personality. Instagram's really good for that. And this is how other people find you. They check you out and you have to be consistent. Mm. From the artist's point of view, though, it's really good for reflection. It's like the modern-day art journaling, you know, like what mm. did I do then? And I, I quite like that. And I feel like people should be proud of what they're putting on there. I know, Melanie, when you do the photography thing, it's, like, it's part of who you are, you know. Being an artist, I think it's more being a creative. So you look at the world creatively. So the quotes that you love, the the favourite drink you have is probably beautiful colour and the way that you see the world is part of being an artist. And so I feel like instead of seeing it as, as this burden that maybe we should be seeing it as a journalist, like, yeah, that's that's what you can check me out. You know, artists yeah. always ask to describe their life. Mm, go and have a look. <laughs> and that's not mean to say, you know, you don't need to see what I had for breakfast, but yeah. I've kind of taken a little bit of a different slant on that, probably less commercial. And it's a, a way for people to see what you're about, to reinforce your personality rather than making it this thing we hear a lot about, like, oh, I sold all this stuff on Instagram. It's like yeah. that's good, but that's where my commercial design brain sits and my art has to be more than that, I suppose. Yeah, I'm not really got a grip on it, but you, you I'm everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, one of my favourite things about your um your post on social media is you're connecting to um, you know, artists of the past and creatives of the past and um, and, and linking into, you know, different um, historical facts, um, facts about colour. There's, there's all, always like a very solid um, correspondence between your practice and, and, you know, historical practice. So um, there's always something to learn and be inspired by. Working because you often I know every all of us say like oh, I don't know whether it's worth all this you know but then mm -hmm. I have really lovely comments about oh yeah I saw this it's like you don't need um there's a great talk I can't remember who did it it's an actor it's a TED talk and it's about attention versus intention mm -hmm. and I really really love this everybody should go and watch it um you'll find it's easy mm -hmm. and it's about are you trying to get in attention from other people versus the intention of what you're trying to do. And I think that's a massive shift that would be really nice to see on Instagram, mm. the intention of what you want to show people. Who am I, what I'm trying to work out? And often we don't know. It's just yeah. for us, collective, and, and it's a really beautiful approach to take. I think have that intention about what you want. What, what is so urgent that you have to show the world now? Is it the trees, the, ro the water on the leaf? Yeah. Or, like, yeah, that's where you are. That, it doesn't cost money either. Where attention is about how many people liked you and whether mm. the right people liked you and you can get waylaid and strayed mm. off the track of what really you love about you could, um, attach that to this blog. Yes. No, oh, that's right. We can. We can. What is the hardest thing? about being a painter complete honesty what is the most difficult thing about being a painter focus and staying true to what you really want to do 
Like you get so strayed by what other people are doing and how they're selling and what they're doing and it's like, no, I know, I need to go away from everyone. I know what I want to try and do. And that's why you get worried that if you don't practice every day, you forget. Mm. Crazy obsession that no one really understands you. But I think that's about it. It, Working that mental muscle is is way harder than putting paint on the brush. Absolutely. And what's the most um, positive thing, the most exciting thing I get to do it yeah <laughs> I think I have a, an artist friend Melissa Reed Divine and and when I watched her when she was doing a demo she's I'm just so excited that you want to watch me do this it's like it is a privilege to be able to um to be able to sit in my studio and paint oh what am I whinging about um <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just a lovely way to see the world and and I think sometimes you have to remind yourself of that like I always say to my students, 80% of the love and the joy is from you making it. The other bit or the 5% that when what people think of it is totally out of your control, but what's in your control is enjoying it. And we're really, and this is a product versus process thing that I'm adamant about and we very much lose track of that. Mm. Make sure that you focus on the process rather than, the product and what I love about other artists is I might not even like in, enjoy the product of their work or um, the way it's done but when I listen to them talk about their work and the way they're creating they write up yeah. you know that they're yeah. doing it our duty to make them do it um, so yeah get lost in the process <laughs> all the artists I like all died before they got recognised anyway. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's not comforting, Christy. Now I don't know. <laughs> One final question, and that is: tell us about where people can see your work now and what's coming up. Right. Okay. So um, this year, because we were just coming through COVID and that, a lot of things got cancelled last year, and so they haven't got quite back on. But at the moment, you can find a lot of my work on my website. Um, which is just my name, christineballard.com. And I, I'm i doing wonderful workshops at Gallery 1111 and a few other places. I've been really fortunate and I do really enjoy doing workshops and teaching. They help me be a better artist, I think, because I have to articulate what I'm saying. And then, <laughs> yeah, I should do that myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do enjoy that. Uh, lots of art societies, I'm trekking out to Orange and and things like that I do an art retreat usually overseas but this year I fingers crossed I'll be doing one in Pearl Beach on the central coast and maybe one out near Bathurst um and I'm in the gallery in the Blue Mountains gallery um and um then I'm in Man Young Gallery in Melbourne which is all being closed down so everything's a little bit quiet at the moment and I've got some paintings in the east to show I've got three which is, you know, not a gallery show, but, again, it gets you gets your work out there. And I've been really surprised by how people have found me. I do blogging um, on the on my website. So, of course, that's about history of colour. And I'll do workshops and I will be doing something called Colour Play Celebrations, fingers crossed, but I can't tell you about that yet. Um, that'll be art events. And so, yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and with my painting, I've got about three series um, on the go at the moment. I've just been with the Gallery 188 in a group show. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing a series called River Trails, River Tales. I'm not sure what that's called. It's about when I walk around um, Cook's River, which has given me a little sanity over COVID. And so it's all about water and, and around why do we hang around water to make us feel better? I'm not sure. Um, so there's that. There's the Land of Oz. And I do still like, which you can see a couple of, the background but they have to be found I have to find my still life whether that's um going to people's homes or students or things like that I can't make them that's a bit boring I like the personality that happens through there so yeah and I've got a lot of stuck stack of paintings all around me that haven't been beautiful so we might just um cite all your details of upcoming events etc underneath this blog as well and yep. um, that wraps it up, Christine Bella. Thank you so much. And next time I look forward to interviewing you, Melanie. Yes, I am very much looking forward to it. <laughs> well, happy painting in this um, lovely weather. And, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you back at the studio. That's right, on the other side of the screen. The other side. See you on the other side. Bye.
Thank <laughs> you.